Good evening and welcome to an all new season of the Legal Roundtable. I'm Shaniqua Gray. Tonight on the Legal Roundtable, we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. What is it? What are your rights and remedies? We've got attorneys here who specialize in the area of employment discrimination and they'll be answering a full range of questions about sexual harassment. Later in the show, we'll also be taking your questions that you sent us on Twitter, Facebook, and at the blog at the Legal Roundtable Show. Show.com and it's all going on right here, right now on the Legal Roundtable. Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable. We're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. What is it? What are your rights and remedies? And helping us to better break down and understand sexual harassment in the workplace, we have two attorneys who are very well versed in this area. First, we have attorney Rob Campbell, who represents clients in a variety of employment issues under both state and federal laws, including sexual harassment and retaliation, as well as other employment issues, including employment discrimination, wage payment, workers' compensation, and unemployment compensation. He's also been named to the 2012 and 2013 Louisiana Rising Stars list by the research team at Super Lawyers. We also have Ms. Keisha Campbell, who happens to be the wife of Mr. Rob Campbell, and who is also an attorney with a background on the opposite side of these types of cases, representing large industrial clients who were being sued for sexual harassment and other employment-related issues, including race discrimination, retaliation, and disability discrimination. She has also given presentations and training to companies on various employment issues, including sexual harassment, and she currently works part-time doing investigations of harassment and discrimination complaints. So we've definitely got sexual harassment completely covered with our two guests this evening. Thank you both and welcome to the Legal Roundtable. Thank, Thank you for having us. Mr. Campbell, I want to start with you because sexual harassment is much broader than most people think. They usually look at it in terms of um, an offer or request for sex only in exchange for something economic like a raise or a promotion, but sexual harassment is actually much broader than that, correct? Could you elaborate on the type of conduct and the type of harm that can result in sexual harassment? Well, sure. The, the first one that you just described is, uh, is called a quid pro quo. Uh, scenario and that's where somebody is asking you um, for something in exchange for like a promotion or something like that that's the classic example that you just mentioned but there are others uh, one of them that we'll probably get into is a hostile work environment uh, mm -hmm. claim and in that uh, there could be many instances of uh, it could be an environment where there are males that are uh, doing things that are making females very uncomfortable but it has to make sure that it is uh, sexually charged. It can't just be uh, just joking around or anything like that. It's got to be of a sexual nature, and it does have to be unwanted. So those are the two ones that we see mostly are a hostile work environment claim and a quid pro quo, prid, quid pro quo sexual harassment claim. Okay, now when you talk about the type of injury or harm, because considering, as you say, the quid pro quo, you know, we're typically talking about, you know, something economic, I guess, in most situations. What other type of harm or injury would a person be able to recover for for a sexual harassment claim? Well, if we had a claim under, uh, under Title VII, which is normally uh, what we would file under in, in a federal lawsuit, mm -hmm. we could get uh, compensatory damages. Um, we could also get uh, mental anguish damages, pain and suffering, uh, also front pay and back pay. So there's a whole different type of remedies that you can get. There are also punitive damages that you can get under the statute as well as attorney's fees. So what really matters is under the scenario where we're getting something more than wages, that's when you get into how it's impacted you. To prove that, you're going to have to get something besides just you complaining of it. If you're going to a counselor, um, to your doctor, you're complaining of it, you're suffering some other problem because of it, you're suffering from depression or anxiety, you're having medication on there, that's going to show the judge or the jury that it's really taking an emotional toll on you. Now, you can recover damages alone if you're just testifying how it's impacted you, mm -hmm. but it might not be nearly as much. 
Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the conduct that can result in um, a sexual harassment claim um, because that seems to be a little bit broader than people may think. And, um, I, and later on in the show, we're going to be taking some questions from the audience that came in over Twitter, Facebook, and the blog. But as applicable, I'll be bringing in some of those to our discussion. But one of those questions that they're concerned about is if you work in a small company or, a, you know, a, maybe a sole ownership proprietorship or something like that. So could you tell us a little bit about to what employers these types of claims apply to? Because it's not any job, right? Correct. If to, to file a claim for sexual harassment under Title VII, it only applies to employers with 15 or more employees total. Mm -hmm. So in Louisiana, there is no uh, claim, there's no state law claim mm -hmm. that can cover uh, employers for under 15 employees. But that doesn't mean that you don't have any recovery or any avenue to get into court. It might not be your classic example of a sexual harassment case that, we're, that we normally see on television or in movies, but it could be something that it's going to be much more worse. It's going to be much worse. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be something, it would be an intentional infliction of emotional distress claim. Those are very difficult um, to, to prevail on, mm -hmm. but if the conduct is so severe and pervasive and it's just shocking to the conscience, then that can be recoverable against an employer with less than 15 employees. You could also have a uh, sexual battery mm -hmm. or sexual assault type claim. If it just rises to that level, right. those employee, the employees do have a remedy, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be a typical regular sexual harassment claim. So it might just fall under regular civil law or regular criminal law as the conduct warrants Correct. what it might be. Okay, and also let's talk about the range of the victim because the victim does not have to be any particular sex. Um, I know it can even be same sex or it can be someone who is not even the person being harassed, right? Correct, right. Okay. The, the person being harassed mm -hmm. can be male or female okay. and it can be, they can be harassed by a person of the opposite sex or they could be harassed by somebody of the same sex. The instance that you were describing mm -hmm. is the, it can be a retaliation claim, and it could be somebody that sees what's happening, reports it to the employer, and then they get in trouble. Okay. They get retaliated against, or they get fired or demoted because they are reporting what they perceive as sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. So not only does the person uh, not have to be of the same sex, but it could be somebody else out there that's viewing this and reports this. Okay. They can be covered under uh, and protected as well. Now let's bring you in this, uh, Ms. Campbell, because obviously you all are married and your background is on the opposite side of the table representing defendants and companies who have been, who have lawsuits against them for sexual harassment. And now you're doing, um, you do investigations and you help to investigate these cases. Could you tell us what unique advantage your background in the defense side, what that brings to the table in terms of representing these plaintiffs now? Well, it helps to be able to tell the clients when they come in, you know, what your strong points of your case are and what your weak points of your case are. And I always looked for those on the defense side. There's certain things that we would look for in a case. So now I'm able to tell Rob, you should tell your clients, you know, th these are the things that you need to look out for mm -hmm. when, you're, um, when you're developing your case and trying to figure out strategy and things like that. Now, in the course of, of your investigations, because you investigate these sexual harassment claims, a question that I've gotten quite a bit from our viewers is, how do we prove these cases? Because we know that a lot of this is going on behind closed doors. How do they prove the case? What action should they take? And even from your perspective, investigating the cases, what do you look for in order to help prove them? We look for emails. I mean, any documentation, voicemails, text messages, recordings. I mean, I know on both sides of the case, I've gotten discovery, you know, I've sent discovery and then I've tried to answer discovery where they're asking for video recordings or digital recordings, voicemails, text messages. It just seems a, a lot these days, people just, I mean, text, that's how they communicate. So, and, and I mean, you may not think that all of those can be retrieved, but they can. And um, so a lot of times you can get good proof that way. And then also, I know it's always a lot of he said, she said, and um, there's no witnesses to the conduct. So um, I always tell people to try to, is there anyone else that he did this to? Um, because that's always really good evidence that, well, if he did this to someone else a year ago, then it's 
it's likely that I'm telling the truth. So th that's the types of evidence that I would look for in terms of, you know, trying to prove this case or trying to, you know, disprove it on the, on the other side. Are you finding it to be easier as technology continues to evolve or is it more complicated with, the, with more technology? It's definitely more complicated because in terms of your discovery burdens as, as attorneys and, you know, each side, we, you know, we'd have to go search, you know, these big companies, databases and things you know, that can be a little difficult. So it does, in terms of when you get actually into a lawsuit, mm -hmm. it has made it uh, more tedious and, and more time consuming to find these things. Okay. But I mean, they're out there. Okay. So it's, you know, it's whether you can take the time to, to actually find it because there's usually always a voicemail or a text message or something. an email or, because I mean, you just, a lot of times, you know, when you're sending emails, you don't think about that this could be, you know, Exhibit A one day in the future, especially with jokes and things that you tend to pass on. And we'll pick up right there in just a moment. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to take your questions that you sent us on Facebook, Twitter, and over the blog in just a moment. So stay with us. Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable. We're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. What is it? What are your rights and remedies? And in this segment, we're taking some of your questions that you sent us on Twitter, Facebook, and the blog. And one question that we received dealt with suggestions for an employer an employer on how to avoid sexual harassment lawsuits and I know you have conducted trainings at, at companies on this very issue so what suggestions or recommendations would you give an employer on how to avoid these types of sexual harassment claims well your key way to defend these claims is to show that you have policies and you disseminate them and you train your employees on them so you want to have a zero tolerance sexual harassment policy. You want to have it posted in your offices. You want to pass it out to your employees, have them sign an acknowledgement saying that they've read it and they understand it. And then you want to conduct periodic training on that policy to where you make it real to them and it's not just words on a piece of paper. I used to give training where we would do reenactments or scenarios of situations that may or may not be harassment and then we discuss it with employees. So that's just a way to make the written policy actually work, it, you know, show them how it works in the workplace. People because when it's just a piece of paper, it's just kind of hard for people to understand, exactly. you know, what it means. And, that's and then you also, it's very important that you have a complaint process that's, mm -hmm. that's spelled out again in writing. And it's, it's, you make it, make it known to your employees about how they can complain if they feel they've been harassed or they've witnessed someone else mm -hmm. being harassed. And once an employee complains, an employer must do a thorough investigation. Mm -hmm. And then if they found that there is wrongdoing, they have to correct it. Okay. And if, the, if an employer doesn't do that, then they're not going to be successful defending the lawsuit. And I think if an employer is doing all that, then they're going to create a culture in their workplace of zero tolerance of sexual harassment. And then hopefully over time, that culture will permeate throughout the office and maybe you will, you know, have less of that going on in the office because I know it goes on in most offices right so you just kind of had to set the tone and they have to know what to do and how to best handle it okay mr. Campbell another question I'd love for you to answer is a question that we got a lot of people pose which was how do you know when you've crossed the line between the flirting or the casual compliments and when it crosses over to sexual harassment and even as the person being harassed how do you know when it has crossed the line into being sexually harassed well let's take it from the point of view of the person being harassed once it feels like it's 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 bothering you and it's unwelcome uh, that is when you need to stand up for yourself and say no this is unwelcome I don't want to deal with this please stop this is my job this is important to me I don't want to act like this in this in this environment please stop then you're drawing the line in the sand saying this is unwelcome I don't want to deal with this if it keeps happening from there that's when you go to uh, your supervisor, if your supervisor is doing it, you go above them or you call a hotline mm -hmm. and that's when you make the complaints on when to do it. Now from the standpoint of the person that might be complimentary to somebody, um, you just have to be very careful. 
uh, I don't think it is that big of a problem if you're compl you know, your, you know, your hair looks nice today. Did you get a haircut or something like that? I mean, that's generally, and especially if you're, if you're friendly with somebody, that generally goes on in any office, um, especially for working with somebody from a day-to-day period but um, if you're going past like if you're getting very personal on things that is when red lights should be going off in your head that maybe I'm I'm starting to cross the line and you're trying to go after somebody and start to date somebody that is when it's going to start getting murky and that's where you need to be very careful so thank you all very much for coming. You all have provided us with some great and invaluable information on this very, very important topic. And I thank you so much for coming. That's all we have time for in this segment. We'll be back in just a moment with more of the Legal Roundtable. to the Legal Roundtable, we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. What is it? What are your rights and remedies? And in this segment, we're talking to attorney Jill Kraft. Ms. Kraft is an attorney whose career has primarily focused in the areas of civil rights litigation and employment discrimination, including but not limited to sexual harassment litigation and other employment-related issues under both state and federal law. She's tried cases all over the state and in other states and litigated in various appellate courts, including in the United States Supreme Court. Ms. Kraft is one of the most well-known litigators in the area of employment discrimination and civil rights. Welcome to the Legal Roundtable, Ms. Kraft. I'm glad to be here. Okay, I'm very happy to have you here to participate in this discussion because you are very well known for your work in this particular area. So I would like for you to give us a little bit of insight. Um, first of all, why did, why did you choose this particular area of law in which to practice? Um, well, number one, because it's completely the right thing to do. Um, number two, because I think as coming from a minority background in the practice of law, female, um, I've obviously seen an awful lot. But I think the primary reason that I chose this particular pro profession in this particular area is because I'm a survivor of assault myself. Mm -hmm. um, so in advocating for victims of sexual harassment and various types of discrimination, it's, it's something, number one, I understand, and number two, um, completely sympathize with the people that I represent. Mm -hmm. it, it is a passion of mine. I am truly committed to making change and making a difference for both personal and professional as well as broad societal reasons. I mean, it's important that we keep up the fight. Okay, and you know, you have been known for representing certain high profile cases, so to speak. What do you consider in determining which cases you're going to take and which ones you don't feel necessarily are the best cases for you? It, it's really difficult um, because <clears throat> most people, you know, when they contact an attorney, truly have been wronged and, and they really need a sense of reassurance. Unfortunately, we're a small group of lawyers in my office and we can't reach out to everybody. But among the considerations that I look at, number one would be the strength of the potential client. I mean, you can have a case that looks great on paper. It has all the buzzwords, meets everything under the sun, and one that maybe not so much. But the strength of the plaintiff is a lot better. Um, in my office, we have a rule, which is if you lie about your Social Security number, your app, something, anything insignificant, we will not represent you under any circumstance. Because it, these cases truly rise and fall on the credibility of the victim and their ability to tell their story. I have won cases where the only person who is there verifying what happened to them is the victim. And they can have six or seven other people on the other side saying it didn't happen and this is really what happened. The problem is one person maybe can lie, like on the other side consistently, but more than one, it's impossible. And juries see right through that every time. And you know, that brings me to a good question, which is, you know, what do you find to be the most difficult part of bringing these types of cases? I mean, is it your, the, the ability to find good evidence or your witnesses or what is it? I think the most difficult aspect of what I do every day um, is trying to help my clients transition through the emotional response to what's happened to them. It's much akin to, I think there was a book by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross about 25 years ago, and it was called On Death and Dying. 
And what it talked about were the stages of dealing with the death. Um, while not as dramatic, every one of my clients relive those phases of, you know, self-blame, um, a shame, afraid to talk about it. And it's rarely through a trial or litigation or even a settlement that they ever reach the phase of resolution. Some of my clients become very empowered the first moment they stand up, meet with me, and, okay, we're going, let's do it. Some of them, it's very difficult over the years that it takes to litigate one of these cases to come to an emotional reality of what has happened to them and how best they can deal with it going forward. Um, it's, it, that's the hardest part of my job. Um, most victims of, of sexual harassment in particular, it's been my experience, and I'm not sure if it's statistically supportable or not, but most victims of sexual harassment have some sort of past history of, of some sort of sexual assault, some sort of sexual trauma, some sort of abusive situation. Mm -hmm. And so in a sexual harassment case, they're almost, it's like they're reliving the past Everything circumstance, right, has gone and then reliving it in the present context. And that's interesting that you brought up some t statistics because I've looked at so many. It appears that in recent years there has been a reduction in the overall number of sexual harassment claims filed this year, but there's been a rise in the number of claims being brought by men. And to what do you attribute that rise in claims that are being filed by men? I think that it has a lot to do with, I mean, the first male-on-male -male big sexual harassment case nationally was back in the 90s. And that was a case called On Call. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court and actually came out of this federal judicial district. And it's kind of like the whole notion of when somebody breaks the barrier, it's a, le it's a little bit easier for the next one. It's certainly easier for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And I really attribute it to public awareness um, and the courage and strength of some of those early male victims to really stand up and say, okay, this happened to me. In the male-on-male -male context, my relationship with my clients is a lot more difficult because their emotional response as a female is something that is hard for me to understand. Um, but their emotional response in some sense is a lot more guttural than my female victims, um, especially when I'm dealing with a male victim who is not homosexual but is being propositioned by a male who may or may not be homosexual. And the emotions that they have to deal with are absolutely, uh, you know, tremendous. And, and I know that you have recently, you brought up the first successful same-sex sexual harassment case in Louisiana. So what was, was there anything unique um, about that case that led you to believe that that was the right case to take all the way to that point? I, I'm, I'm very fortunate because my client in that case is really a, a, a terrific guy. Um, he is truly a man's man. I mean, he's a sports coach, you know, an outdoor. And it, I think it took everything in his being really to not react in the workplace like, you know, as he shares with me, he would in an ordinary thing, which is, you know, punch the heck out of the guy and, you know, call it a day. Um, I think in that particular case, it, it was, he had a lot of strong evidence in addition to the strength of his personality. Mm -hmm. um, we had text messages in that case, which are very unusual, mm -hmm. um, but something I'm seeing a lot more of in, in my practice. Mm -hmm. um, he had great coworker support. Um, a couple of people actually lost their job and or quit as a result of what happened to him. And those things kind of stand as a testament to how how amazing that particular gentleman is. Okay, well we're gonna pick up a little bit more and find out a little bit more about bringing same-sex sexual harassment cases in just a moment, as well as take up a few questions that sure. we got from the audience on Facebook, Twitter, and the blog. So we'll be right back in just a moment with more from the Legal Roundtable. back to the Legal Roundtable, we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. And we're talking with attorney Jill Kraft, who specializes in employment discrimination issues as well as civil rights issues. And when we, when we left off, you were talking about same-sex sexual harassment cases. And could you tell us whether there is any different or greater standard that a person must meet if they're bringing a same-sex sexual harassment case? Um, actually, the way the, the law currently stands, and I think it's appropriate, is there is no different standard. 
you are still left with, you know, whether it's a same-sex harassment case or, you know, an opposite sex sexual harassment case, the ultimate standard, which is, was the harassment because of or on account of sex. That's the standard. Um, in the case that I tried, in particular, the jury asked a question, do we have to find that he's homosexual? And the judge said, well, yes, you do, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal said, no. <laughs> It's only whether or not they have proven that this was because of or on account of sex. So the standard is identical. It's just, I think, a little bit different elements, a little bit different in the manner in which you present your case. And that's good because that certainly would be a difficult standard to meet to sure. actually try to show that sure. a person actually is homosexual. Well, and it goes with the whole thing about we're not getting into people's bedrooms. I mean, exactly. You know, I right. mean, we just really don't know. Um, I have another question that um, I put this out there on Facebook and Twitter, and I got some questions, great questions from the audience. But one wanted to know about any rights of a person who may be wrongfully accused of sexual harassment what do they what rights do they have well in in general terms they have a right to file a suit for defamation libel and slander mm -hmm. um, that only works if the accusation of sexual harassment was made outside the workplace but basically what that means is if an employer investigates a sexual harassment complaint inside the working environment working situation nobody leaks it outside to you know other folks and it's entirely internal then the employer is not going to be liable for that they are going to be shielded by something that's called qualified privilege um, in in terms of can i sue my coworker? yes um, are those lawsuits typically successful no um, defamation claims are very difficult a to prove and b to hold on to over the grand scheme of things. But they do have rights, and, and I encourage anybody who's been in that situation, pursue them. And um, as we wrap up our discussion on sexual harassment, one of the major issues that people are having with this is knowing you know, what time limitations they have, because obviously it typically takes a while before it becomes harassment, but then you have these time limitations as well. How long does a person have to bring the claim, and when does time really begin to run? Well, I always encourage every one of my clients to report it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think when they get to the point where they're like, I have to report it, then, then you it triggers off of, has the harassment continued? Has it stopped? If it stopped once you reported it, then you may or may not have any right to pursue a claim at all. Mm -hmm. If it continues after your employer knows or should have known it's been going on, then I think that's the time you need to be acting. Certainly, if anything significant in your employment relationship happens, like you're demoted, um, threatened with termination, terminated, transferred, any of those kind of traditional, tangible employment actions, then you need to act. Your time limitations, if you're pursuing it under the federal statute, are going to be 300 days from the last act of discrimination or harassment to file with the EEOC. Our state statute has a one-year prescriptive period which is suspended for a period of up to six months while you're pending with the EEOC. The bottom line from my perspective is I tell everybody, if you think it's going on, it, and then file immediately. Um, don't wait. Um, the Supreme Court, fortunately for us, clarified the issue in a case called Morgan versus National Passenger Railroad Company about in a harassment situation you pick up from the last incident. And they even give examples in the opinion about if something happens day one through 299, et cetera. Um, but again, my counsel to people is always act and act quickly. As soon as possible. Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Kraft. You have provided some great and invaluable information for our viewers, and we, it has certainly come from a great authority on the issue, so I appreciate you being here. Well, I'm glad you had us. Thank you. And that's all we have time for on this edition of the Legal Roundtable. Join us next time for the next edition of the Legal Roundtable. Until then, you can always keep up with what's going on the show at the blog at www.thelegalroundtable.com. Till next time, I'm Shanique Bourgoy.